Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth. Actually, I'm going to give before I welcome you, I'm going to let everyone come in for a second. I forgot there's some uh, lag time as, as folks come in the room. All right, folks seem like they're still uh, filtering in here. All right, it seems like it's stabilizing, so I'm gonna go ahead and get, get started. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, on this Sunday. This is the fifth edition of the Kitchen Table Reading Series. Um, I hope that everyone is staying help, um, safe and, and healthy out there. If you're joining us from, from Texas, I hope uh, power, heat, uh, water are coming back online for you um, and that, that you safely weathered the storm with your families. Um, we're coming back at you today from the kitchen table. Um, my body is conveniently blocking some uh, dirty dishes. I'm glad I have broad shoulders. Um, coming back at you today with some supremely talented poets, Nandi Comer, um, Mitchell L.H. Douglas, and Cynthia Dewey uh, Oka. All right. Um, as our regular audience knows, we always start uh, with the keep the lights on section of, of the reading. Um, so the spirit of the reading is, is non-commercial, right? Um, but if you want poetry and now suddenly, um, thanks to Amanda Gorman, Americans want poetry at major uh, holidays such as the Super Bowl. Um, if you want poetry, then poets have to eat, right? So during the reading, I'll, I'll throw a list of um, recent uh, poetry collections by each of the poets into the chat. And I do hope that you'll buy a copy of their book, preferably at your um, local bookstore. Lots of spring birthdays coming up. Um, so give the gift of, of poetry. Um, I'm also indebted to the Solstice MFA program where I teach poetry. Um, Solstice is generously allowing me to use um, their, their Zoom account. And we're a wonderful writing community. We have folks um, geographically uh, across the, the country, age range, uh, gender range, uh, range of, of different races and ethnicities. Um, and, and so folks are really committed to, to writing their stories in an authentic way. And if you're interested in, in exploring that, um, Please, please look us up. Uh, we're, we're a close-knit environment, and I love being a part of that group. Um, all right. Let us do what we came to do. Um, not all the time, but sometimes I love poems that are, are mysterious to me, um, that make associative leaps, that move a little bit beyond my control. So in that spirit, I thought I'd start off with a, a Read a Dove poem. Um, uh, I read a dove poem called Primer for the Nuclear Age. Primer for the Nuclear Age. At the edge of the mariner's map is written, beyond this point lie monsters. Someone left the light on in the pantry. There's a skull in there on the shelf that talks. Blue eyes in the air, blue as an idiot. Any fear, any memory will do. And if you've got a heart at all, someday it will kill you. I love that poem, although I know that it's a little <laughs> bit of a dark way to start a, a February Friday. All right, uh, let's dip into this uh, all-star lineup of, uh, of poets. Uh, feel free to light up the chat before, during, and after the reading. I can get a little lonely on this side of the, the webinar because, because we can't see you. Um, so first up, we ha we've had uh, a couple Detroit poets on, so either who are living in Detroit or born and raised in Detroit. Um, so uh, contributing to that lineage, we have uh, straight out of Detroit, Nandi Comer. Let's see. Um, I just want to make sure my is my video on because I'm not there. We yep, go. I think, you're all set. I think you're all good. Okay. 
So sorry about that. Usually I'm usually I'm pretty much on it on these things. And then I uh, then I all of a sudden I'm like, wait, is my video on? Is my volume on? Can you see me? Zoom life, right, y'all? Um, so Ian, one of the things uh, that I loved about this, first of all, thank you so much for having me come and um, join you all this afternoon. Um, but I love the fact that we start off with a poem from someone else. And I've been thinking about the uh, folks in Texas and I just had to bring um, one of my favorite uh, poets who's originally from Texas, Vivi Francis. And I'm reading her um, title poem from her second collection, Horse in the Dark. Horse in the Dark for Paula Roper. Brown as a mule, I stumped through the flocking geese who thought themselves swans, but a mule knows its opposite and so did I. They were no swans. A horse can be broken by such beauty. A horse may follow it down a slope that will slice its hooves. Beauty like a restless man in a tall hat, a wandering boy with teeth white as if he had never known meat or the score of water over stones. I leapt up for the rain cloud shaped like a darker horse, failed a too, far, too tall fence, believing a horse could be loved more and written less until we fell apart, the horse I and I. We who had prayed for a heaven of toothless grass and barley, how did we untwine? When did my long face pull itself into this form? How did words replace nay? Two legs took my four, and I, freed of my horse self who lay dead in the, to the world, ran through the clover on two legs, ran and ran. That's Vivi Francis, Horse in the Dark. So um, I am thinking a lot about this month being Black History Month. And so um, I'm actually gonna be reading from my chat book, uh, American Family, A Syndrome. Um, and a lot of the poems are written in two parts. And so I'm just gonna start off with, they have, they're written in two voices, the title poems from American Family. Um, and there's a, medical voice that introduces the lyric voice. So I start off with the medical voice always. They're invented, these are invented syndromes that I think um, I wrote them because I felt like I had seen these kind of um, mental illnesses popping up in our community. And so these are my responses to some things that probably aren't diagnosed yet, but I see it happening in my community. American family, a syndrome, early death syndrome. Terminal illness. Upon learning the short life expectancy of men and women from his or her community, a patient suffering from EDS embraces the inevitability of an early death. Usually signs of EDS exhibit in black males and females ranging from ages 10 to 35. Early symptoms include testing the limits of pain by engaging in suicidal activities such as dislocating joints out of sockets, jumping from rooftops, and or participating in backyard mixed martial arts competitions. Generally, these activities are followed by an unhealthy consumption of processed food and insomnia. In many cases, a patient imagines his limbs disappearing and reappearing. Most patients have been known to whisper to friends and family that they are already gone. Almost all have experienced dreams depicting their own deaths and or funerals. Patients express debilitating survival behavior, such as a distrust of all strangers and feelings of constant endangerment. At the same time, the knowledge of an early demise causes fearless behavior. Some have been known to stand in close proximity to high speeding traffic, while others resort to consuming poisonous substances. In most common cases, patients violently provoke others suffering from the same illness. 
in rare occurrences, patients develop debilitating behavior similar to the avoidant personality disorder, otherwise known as the hermit complex. Unfortunately, neither denying nor provoking an early death has proven to be resourceful in the treatment of this fatal disease. Almost all patients find their demise under the following circumstances, violence inflicted by a member of private security, mistaken identity by law enforcement, self-inflicted wounds, or lethal assault by a private citizen. Early death syndrome. Remember that time cops found cousin Rosa on the east side carjacking some woman, said she stepped right out in front of a silver caprice, pulled that frightened lady out of her car like a rag. Remember how her daughter had to go down to the precinct, had to explain that her mother got them voices. Remember her brother, the slim shell of a boy, how he put three bullets in her mother, then left himself shot and dead in the river. Coward, Uncle Oka, Oka called him. The devil, said mama hyperparanoid schizophrenic say to docs and remember the girl he loved when she heard she dropped all her body rubber band legs and horse shoulders dropped them all in the middle of the den like a sack of oranges remember how the whole family came to the cemetery to put mother and son in the ground how rosa refused to buy the coffin said she'd re she'd rather build boxes from the planks of her picket fence said each board carried the sound of her family's southern snarled grief, each of her dead meshed in the wood grain, and who hasn't seen death, that ruthless engineer stacked the bricks of this rickety house, one broken brain on top of another. Rosa's uncle took his wife by knife, and cousin Robert still hold a bullet in his back from when his mother tried and failed. Death can be relentless with his building, can't he? You remember Rosa in the street screaming down at that woman, something about the car, or was it something about her brother? I mean, granddad, or was it about auntie or me or? Anarcha appears again and again. Anarka is one of the uh, slave women who's named in the journals of Dr. Sims, who Dr. Sims was the first doctor to come up with, uh, to be credited with a lot of the medical uh, equipment that we use for, for today's um, uh, gynecologist. And he came up with these utensils as a result of working with a lot of slave women without um, without permission, without their consent. And Anarka is one of the few people that he named in the journals that he had written about his procedures. Anarka appears again and again after Rachel Liza Griffith. Once I was a slave, then I was an Alabama woman, a hushed experiment hidden between the damp thighs of Tuskegee men. Too many times a newborn next to my mother in LA General County Hospital. Her slick syllables said something in Spanish, something in English, something about sterility, something about tubes. I am plump and soft and have not always had this hair, always damaged, always ruined, sent away to be fixed and corrected. I am America's opaque shadow, tossed like a dog riding on every country roadside. I've been Gila cells passed around like Halloween candy. Are the doctors still waiting for their black offering me a silk dress of skin? Consider this. Each moment I am perched on an examination table is my break, diseased heart, taken child, this is how I feel, wide, dark, lumpy, cotton at the bottom of a pillowcase. My cartilage has been trustworthy in its role, how it performs its design duty, how it keeps fastened my flesh to bone. If I could be more than a specimen, more than a collection of daffodils, flora would mean I was not here. Don't you see? I am still here on all fours, I was never bone, nor beast, nor symbol for suffering. I am a compass for warnings, a cured tissue. They are still dressing me for the cut, 
and I prep for the familiar cold gauze turned warm, then wet, then red. And the last poem I have for today is American Family a Syndrome, Blood Washer Syndrome. It's another two part piece, but it's, yeah. Blood Washer Syndrome, temporary disorder triggered by repeated viewings of video recorded police killings, often in a single day. A blood washer patient, typically a father, develops an inexplicable urge to wash sidewalks. In the early stages of this illness, patients spend prolonged moments looking at the floor or their feet. Though early symptoms of blood washer syndrome surface in various ways, the disease fully initializes when the patient in a hypnotic trance wanders outside carrying a bucket. His movements become methodical. He will start at any street corner, rinse an area of pavement, apply detergent, rinse the section, then continue to the adjacent area and repeat the sequence. During his laps, patients do not pause for food, water, or bathroom breaks. Not to be confused with coffin maker syndrome, blood, make, blood washer syndrome, um, intermittently repeat blood, 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 there is so much blood on the walk. Symptoms can exhibit for hours or days. Oftentimes, once the trance lifts, subjects are unaware that they have been under the blood washer's trance. Many feel disoriented and nausea when the trance breaks. If early signs of blood washer syndrome are exhibited in a possible patient's behavior, it is best to avoid late night television, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter for two weeks. Ultimately, it is best for the patient to submit himself for psychological observation for 48 hours or until early symptoms subside. Blood washer syndrome. Blood, blood, blood. There is so much blood on the walk. Blood, blood, blood. There is so much blood on the walk. Blood, blood, blood. There is so much blood on the walk. Blood, blood, blood. There's so much blood on the walk. Blood, blood, blood. There is blood, blood. There is so much blood. Blood, there is so much blood on the walk. Blood, blood, blood. There is so much blood on the walk. Blood, blood, blood. There is so much blood. Blood, blood. There is so much blood on the walk. Blood, blood, blood. There is so much blood on the walk. Thank you. Oof. It's gonna, it's gonna take me a, a minute to settle down. Thank you so much, Nandi. That was um, stunning, striking. Um, a couple lines jumped out. Uh, I am America's opaque shadow and death can, can be relentless uh, in, indeed. Um, wow. Next up, um, we have Mitchell L.H. Douglas coming up on the stage and he's, Mitchell, are you still in Indianapolis? Am I getting that right? I am, yes. All right, good to see you, man. Hey. Um, I'm, I'm getting some texts that folks are having a little trouble getting in. Um, some longtime audience members are saying they're having some trouble getting in. So I don't know what's happening on the back end, but I know you uh, might have had some trouble too. So thank you for making it and then sorry for any technical difficulties. And I'll let you take it away, man. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. I'm just happy to be here. What's up, y'all? Um, Nandi, like, man. Whew. Um, it's good to be in a place with poets and people care about poetry on this day that Malcolm was taken from us on this birthday of Nina Simone, right? So we've got some songs to sing. Um, I want to start with a Gwendolyn Brooks poem. And um, you'll see this as a segue into my first poem. Uh, this is from uh, Street in um, Bronzeville. This is called Kitchenette Building. We are things of dry hours an involuntary plan, grayed in and gray. Dream makes a giddy sound, sound not strong like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man. 
But could a dream send up through onion fumes? It's white and violet. Fight with fried potatoes and yesterday's garbage. Ripening in the hall. Flutter or sing an aria down these rooms. Even if we were willing to let it in, had time to warm it. Keep it very clean. Anticipate a message. Let it begin. We wonder, but not well, not for a minute. Since number five is out of the bathroom now, we think of lukewarm water. Hope we get in it. So I watch Jeopardy a lot with my daughter, um, or admittedly used to more when Alex Trebek was there. Um, we're watching one night and Gwendolyn Brooks is a Jeopardy question. Um, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> people didn't get the answer to the question. And uh, it became, and I, and I tweeted it, um, and now the tweet starts this poem. Uh, so this is, um, uh, by the way, I'm reading kind of newer stuff for everybody. I wanted to share new stuff with you. Um, this is called Poem That Begins With a Tweet about Gwendolyn Brooks. Gwendolyn Brooks was a Jeopardy question no one can answer tonight. That's a metaphor too painful to wrap my head around. And I said the poem is about love because all poems are about love. And you rolled your eyes so hard, I thought they would snap back to center with cherries and diamonds. The flit of your lashes renders me nameless and I fall blank for what feels like a block. Falling is a metaphor for my life, unsettled, unmoored. I capitalize love because it, is, because it is bigger than what we are or what we give credit for. Oaken, open. For that, you have no answer. Your breath in kitchenettes, halved, quartered, cut again. So does everybody remember um, the picture of Devante Hart? It was a little boy had on this, like this mean uh, brim uh, and he was hugging a police officer, right? And he was crying. Um, and everybody thought this was, um, Everybody thought this was the, the coolest picture, right? Until we found out later what was really going on in Devante's life um, and how difficult you know, his life really was. So this is a poem dedicated to him. It's called Seer for Devante Hart. You can't have this body. There is no blue that can soak my weight, sink my heart. I want to be free. See me flying on a distant wave, hat blown to the wind and the sheer force of now. I don't want to be somebody, I am somebody. I'm just waiting for you to notice. There was a time when I smiled, the curl of my lips a bow pulled tight for flight. Things are different now. There are two faces, two mothers, a whole lot of empty. I wasn't crying for the reason you think I was crying. And why couldn't anyone who ever loved a child see? If you never find me, brown and buoyant against the current, know that I move like the dreams of boys held underwater. In other words, I move like the dreams of boys held under. I move like the dreams of boys held. I move like the dreams of boys. I move like the dreams. I move like. So yeah, for Devante, I think about him a lot. Um, this poem, I should mention, um, and you guys will probably feel the pain of this, but I had two poems that were supposed to be, I wanted to be in my last book, Dying in the Scarecrow's Arms. And by the time I got them to where I wanted them, uh, my editor was like, nah, it's too late. <laughs> And so I was like, 
Uh, all right, but you know, happens for a reason, right? Um, I feel like the poems are better um, because they got to wait. Uh, one of those poems is Persimmons um, and it's about me getting to IU, like my first year in the MFA program. I should note that this poem was actually inspired by Philip B. Williams spinning news clears its throat. And if you remember that poem, you know, Philip's poem was in the shape of a noose. Uh, this poem is in the shape of a tree. Okay, so this is a concrete poem. Uh, it's actually in um, the Furious Flower Anthology. Um, it came out last year. This is called Persimmons. Our state, our comfort, a sweet strange, offered in a pudding by my professor on our first meeting, a cafe on Kirkwood before the start of the semester. Try it, he says, it's a local favorite. I am not local, though I've known poems in states with eyes and enough white skin to make my breath anomaly. So I get the gist quick. Campus is oasis, step outside and its outer limits. I make friends, the only male poet admitted my year. Funny to say now, what stumbling pride for gender. Others follow, including Kentucky ties. I'm shocked to hear a friend admitted the year after me as shut down in workshop over a poem about lynching. Hasn't everything about lynching already been said? Fired a mouth I thought knew better. Have we stopped dying? It's a matter of the pulp and the rendering, how to read what lies beneath the papery skin, forget the seeds. Years later, that friend says, Mitch, you are a roach. You could live anywhere. Plant, uproot, repeat. I suppose there is truth to this. True that I adapt, survive. How I keep my curiosity on the way to Hartwood. Think of her beaten poem and look up the last Indiana lynching on the books. 1930, Marion, not so long ago that the memory is smoke, the photographs that survive of the men who didn't, the proud Hoosier as vector pointing skyward, a finger and smirk, an arrow over shoulder. As if to say, would you look at that? Three plump bulbs ripe in the twine. So, Ooh, I think, I think I'm gonna end on this one. Is that cool? I have one more. Um, I'm starting to feel like, um, and I don't wanna be a downer about this. A lot of people like in my, from the golden age of hip hop keep like checking out on us. And I have all these memories of that because when I was in high school, the thing I used to do with my friends is we should try to get our demo tapes to the rappers that are coming in town to the shows. And yeah, we weren't good and we shouldn't have never been signed. So um, if we were, it would have been crazy. Uh, so this is about the only time I know that somebody actually listened to our demo tape. Um, and this is called, It's a Demo. You don't know this, but Steady B was the only one who took the time Terminator X looked at me like his fist should be connected to my jaw when I slipped him a TDK and told him the name of my crew was R Square PE, radically raged posse in effect. The 80s were cruel to slang and fashion. So was Reagan, but he's not allowed here. Steady B on tour with MC Light, took the chalice of plastic, sat down on his bed, his ear to a boom box while tap money talked to girls who wouldn't look at us twice. Two times the fire years later in the north of death, a PNC, the officer, mother versus cool C on the trigger, not as cool as we thought. B at the wheel, going nowhere. Who cares if we weren't stars? Thank you.
Thank you, Mitchell. Um, where are those Mitchell Douglas Golden Age of Hip Hop demo tapes right now? Oh, I think mean, there's God. a collector's market for that. I hope they are burned somewhere. <laughs> I, know, I know Terminator X was probably like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe one of those will surface on uh, eBay <laughs> one of these days. <laughs> I uh, uh, hope not, God. Well, thank you. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate this so much. Yeah, thanks for thanks for hanging out with us. A couple lines um, stuck out. You you can't have this body, and not so long ago that the memory is is smoke. I, I appreciate um, your words and your poems, man. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate yours too. Thank you for for being here. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. Next up. Um, so Philly is my uh, adopted hometown, my spiritual center. So I get a little nervous when we haven't had a, a Philly-based poet on for a while, which which did not um, happen in, in December. Um, so although this poet has moved out to Collingswood, New Jersey, which is just across the Ben Franklin, she's still in, obviously in the orbit of, of Philly. Um, so fulfilling my need today, we have Cynthia Dewi Oka. Cynthia, welcome. Thank you so much, Ian. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm still feeling really rocked by Nandis and Mitchell's poems. So apologies, I, I'm uh, just incredibly moving. Thank you so much. Um, I feel really grateful to be here. I am going to start with a poem by Chris Abani. Poet of an ordinary heartbreak. Who hasn't been tempted by the sharp edge of a knife? An ordinary knife cutting ordinary tomatoes on an ordinary slab of wood on an ordinary Wednesday. The knife nicks like a bite to the soul. A reminder that what is contemplated is as real as the blood sprouting from a finger, as real as a bruised eye. Instead, turn back to the meat stewing on the stove. Scrape pulpy red flesh into the heat and turn. Say, even this is a prayer. Even this. I am going to read a few poems from my upcoming book, uh, Fire is Not a Country. And uh, I think the only thing you need to know, maybe a, a, a good historical context is I'm Indonesian. Uh, I grew up in Bali, Indonesia. And in 1965, there was a genocide that took place in my homeland that remains very suppressed and censored to this day. And uh, I'm working on a separate uh, project specifically about that historical moment, but a lot of my, um, but this upcoming book, like a lot of the poems in it are really kind of grappling with how the reverberations of historical trauma and then the authoritarian regime that um, rose to power as a result of the genocide um, has continued to kind of reverberate through generations um, and expresses itself in our intimate relationships. So uh, I think that's probably the only context you need. Um, I'll start. Meditation on the worth of anything. A tall man wipes ashes from his lips. I'll pay you, he says, if you're worthy. From the lamp of his skull, a steeple rises. Roaches seek warmth in the dead bells while cherry blossoms burst their green corsets. My mother, at the end of a 12 hour shift at the factory, will heat rice and vegetable soup cooked last weekend and kept frozen to last her six working days to eat while watching reruns of The Good Wife. She does not understand what Juliana Margulies is saying. Sometimes she weeps because memory is long and bendy, a red line that curves around the globe instead of cutting through the center. It begins on a piece of rock represented on the globe by a bump under the fingertip, a body at the bottom of a well, which is a good place if someone's kid could lower a piece of mackerel down to you in a pail twice a day, cleaned of its bones. 
Strange how expensive rice was then with so many bodies in the river, puddles trailing their red ribbons. When I told my mother I was going to start organizing workers, she slapped me with the same hand that used to soothe the long, bumpy scar on my father's chest. I have to make time to cry and eat. Fuck that kamikaze shit. It was not just from grief that shocks of hair fell from my head to the kitchen floor. I wore four sizes too big but iron jeans for the better part of high school and threatened kids by thumbing a knife across the skin of an orange because my parents believed even an ordinary man of no particular feat or achievement could be brought back to life when God wanted to prove a point. In other words, there could be a universal language in whose syntax fire is not a country. Sometimes it's like I'm almost there. Some mornings, smoking, I lock eyes with the squirrel perched perfectly still on the lip of the garbage bin. I picture its soft little lungs flaring like a dahlia. It's true, my mother refused to howl like the dog they called her. My father once glowed. Inside, there is a desk and on it a flower head made of paper. It says, mom. It has six petals around it that unfold, a list of possible destinies. You take great care of me. You cook for everyone. You hear what I have to say. You always cheer me up. You love me. You are the best. And a wire stem wrapped around the frame of a faded photograph. A man with thinning hair and jutting cheekbones, his arm around a girl six or seven in a traditional yellow kabaya. The drawn curtains behind them admit no stones. Her eyes squint. She is smiling, mouth small, red like a liar's word. Protégé. Back on the island, Ganesh lived crouching just outside my parents' bedroom window. At dusk, I often caught him staring at the scepters of papaya and orchid our neighbors laid at his feet. That they'd spoil untouched on the dishes woven of banana leaf was an object lesson in contrast and comparison. My parents, I am that I am, once mad for the scent of burning animals, had evolved to desire no more than our most private language about our most banal humiliations. For years, I heard his voice, felt it at my back like the crisp white of Bougainvillea spilling through the gate's metal bars. In stadiums where we were packed by the tens of thousands, I saw it fell grown men like timber and reassemble them for maximum yield in the free market economy. Oil, tourism, slums and slush funds for the smiling general. Two countries later, I still hide my jealousies. Like my uncle, the one who would not bend, who gambled even the steel braces of his house and left my cousins with nothing but the imprint of a cross in a gray palm. It had to be enough. Listen, there was a head of hardened lava, a lantern in the mountains, a god built from the opened graves and over him, the night hung like a hammer. Um, this next poem is written not in proper grammatical English. It is in English. Uh, and uh, English is my second language. I uh, taught myself uh, how to speak it when I was 10 years old after my family migrated to Canada. And uh, there were no ESL services for Indonesian uh, uh, language speakers. So 
interestingly, even though this poem is like fragmented in that way, it's probably the poem that I feel kind of most like, like I sound like myself in my head, if that makes sense. So I, uh, I ask you to bear with me and I hope you um, can also enjoy it too. Recurring. The ocean pulls, is pulled, pulling back like a bed cover, but instead of drape, rears up on legs, foam flower legs, banished from the light legs with the deep, wide scars of rock and glue. Crushed, crushing, crushes bone, covers the sky, the blue black with the blacker drugged dance of whales crossing out the staring starred harpoon tips. Mountains, cliffs, drums up stampede, legs bulbous boiling, the patienceless legs. Water has a velocity angering, God's debasement hovers. Ran after moon bounces off the smooth lid Father's head like a bottle's shiny, shined, lying simile because he hated, is hated alcohol. Breathless run, rung, mother, sister already out of sight, bright fire, barking eyed, eyeful of the forest of dogs have been loosened, lure of the delinking muscles. A blinkered moon into a mouth, the size of a basement, a bulb with a waving, waved legs. Follow. Breath, heat, in ocean, endangered air, airing armed teeth. Arms, white as the wedding roof, looks up brief, flanks of God's beef, are cysts of fat, fragility. We'll remember the floor ended, isn't ending quickly, then mouth through mouth, the chasm and rope like tooth edge over it end to end. The crater a father has been stepped, steeping black polished foot after foot on the fraying phrase woven of arms, knifed out, offering the self's offing cheap metal while flames finger filigreed. Greedy, the dearness of this loved with ocean poised poisons, the missing we had been left leaving behind this heaving mouth with the leaves made of dogs on the other side. I make, am made, voice veering from the mouth, mutinous tin dying on tongue, volcanic while he halo, goo and grammar, father grass, father vertigo, father long without, doesn't look back at his love, at loving in the rim of mine, flooded by moonlessness to Mobius. He was, isn't, will reach, reasoned by flames licking, whose villain language on the rope that his is going home. It husks me. It does how to resolve. This hole I hold like hellish velocity. Stopped as just is when felled. And this is the last poem. You don't have to be tough all by you, yourself, you said. And if I returned the favor, it was much later. Or I lied at the airport, waiting for my turn to sleep, like a leg bone inside a grasshopper. In the selfie I sent, darkness curtains one side of my head, which hasn't thought of Christopher for years. Aside from his occasional Facebook posts, caption hashtag blessed, blessed below boys in blue jerseys despite the Canucks losing streak. The Rockies look photoshopped, 
but not the beetle-like sacks under his mother's eyes. All seasons, petals by a jacuzzi, cherry-flavored hospital jellos on the lid of the grill, unless they're margaritas. A winking emoji, hashtag fuck cancer, go chemo. I should have sent his mother a letter. Something about that year, everyone could see what was hidden under the oversized t-shirts. And Chris carried my books between history, biology, advanced lit. Plotted with Mr. F to find me among Mrs. F's old maternity clothes, something to wear for the prom. How rotten the colors on those dresses. In open air, the moth holes like tiny kisses. That year, I wanted to leave my life lipstick on the road. Chris of the roses in his chest saying, you will be a great mom. Where is the ocean where the faces of glaciers fall apart? I wrote a poem instead about the woman with red glasses who after a know your rights training gave me her notice to appear stamped Department of Homeland Security. Nobody wants to go home, Chris. Nobody wants their theory of the earth proven. Because I did not believe in kindness, I did not have to see it. All day, I feel my love tug at me from the other side of a blue clarity. I text in my face, when I think it most untouchable. Wake up. The marshaller is waving her orange batons. Most days, a pilot reads the signs and nobody dies. Thank you. Um, that really does, wow. A um, couple, couple months jumped out. I have. I, I appreciate it for all the the scope of those poems. That you, there, were, there were also these like reminders to, to self, like I have to make time to cry and eat. Um, and then uh, who's villain language on, on the rope? Um, just great stuff, amazing. Um, towards the end of, of last year in late December, the, the poet Jean Valentine passed away. Um, and I wanted to honor her today by reading her poem X. Uh, the poem, includes an epigraph that it'll sound not like poetry. X. I have decorated this banner to honor my brother. Our parents did not want his name used publicly from an unnamed child's banner in the AIDS memorial quilt. The boat pond broken off looks back at the sky. I remember looking at you, X, this way, taking in your red hair, your eyes light, and I miss you so. I know, you are you and real, standing there in the doorway, whether dead or whether living, real. Then Y said, who will remember me three years after I die? What is there for my eye to read then? The lamb should not have given his wool. He was so small. At the end, X, you were so small, playing with a stone on your bedspread at the edge of the ocean. All right, uh, that does it for today. Thank you for spending this hour with us. Um, our next kitchen table reading will be in April, uh, the third Sunday in, in April. Thank you again to the Solstice MFA program for, for hosting. Um, bravo and thanks to all the poets. If you could uh, send your appreciation in the chat as, as we head out. Nandi Comer, Mitchell L.H. Douglas, and Cynthia Dewi Oka. Thanks also to Sarah and Amber, our ASL interpreters, um, for helping us make this this event um, accessible to a, to a broader audience. Um, here's the spring being on the horizon, especially those of us in, in the Northeast and apparently now the deep South who have been um, experiencing this winter weather. Uh, I'll see you in April for Poetry Month. Take care.
Can you see me? I can see you. That was awesome. Oh my God. That yeah. was so amazing. That was great. I'm going to need to start building in space because they, uh, they blew me away. Thank you, everyone. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Wow. Uh, this is Meg Carney. She, Carney. She's the um, head of the, the Solstice program. I'm so and glad. Poet as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. I'm, we have to have you all come to Solstice. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Uh, Nandi, I think you're um, muted. Yeah. Are we regrouping at the, in that other link? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I should I'll, I'll be there. over there in a bit. All right. Yeah, Thank you all again. So much. Right. Take care. Bye.